All right, guys, a lot of information to cram in the beginning of the video. This is Narcan nasal spray. Uh, I talked with the company today. They're going to send me 100 of these for free. I want to start sending them to as many people that want it uh, as possible. I have heard that in other parts of the country, it's not as readily available. It's not free. They charge $100, $150 for that insanity to me. Um, it should be free. And uh, I, I'm going to do whatever I can in my power to start getting Narcan to anybody that needs it. Um, because I'm such a good guy. I'm so considerate and I'm so selfless. No, it's, um, I have bad karmic energy. You know, I've probably destroyed more lives than I realize. And, uh, I've been a verbally abusive, selfish litterer. You know, I used to litter. I was, I was that guy. If I can finish my soda and just chuck it out the window. Fuck it. And I want to be a better person. And it helps me stay sober. You know, two things help me stay sober. Fitness and uh, helping other people. Altruism. Um, you know, I'm about 10 pounds heavier than I'd like to be. Um, we're not in like, you know, DEFCON 3. I can still see my cock when I shower. But, you know, how much longer can I keep up this charade of, of uh, being able to see my dick when I'm bathing? You know, eventually you get to that point where you can't. And, um almost impossible to uh, to recover at that point. So I'm going to start working out. I'm going to get back on a paleo diet. That's what I recommend for anybody that uh, wants to know nutritionally what has worked for me in the past when I've been fit. Um, and I'm going to start working out, and I'll probably start doing videos on that, you know. Um, and anything I can do that, that can help you if I've encouraged you to stop doing drugs or... Um, you know, whatever. I want to continue to help in any way that I can. Um, you know, also, patreon.com, Ryan, you know, I had to throw that in, slash Ryan Leone. Check it out. Um, I was able to pay my rent this month from that platform. And in turn, I'm very, I'm much more consistent. There's a ton of content on there that's not on here. Um, and I'm going to start some new series for YouTube. Um, but, you know, they get the early access. I'm going to start doing friend Fridays and fan Fridays. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on one of my friends every Friday. And I'm also going to put on one of the subscribe, one of you guys. Uh, a lot of people message me and they go, hey, uh, you know, I've got stories. If you ever want me to come on your channel, like I'll, I'll do them. Okay, well, we can start doing that. And, you know, uh, I think that it's important, even though, you know, I'm, I don't have a million subscribers like some of these other people, but I still think it's important to give people that have supported me an opportunity, uh, you know, open the door. If you want to try your hand at this, I'm, I'm more than willing to help you with that. Um, and, you know, message me, message me on Patreon. Oh my God, you're charging $3 to, you know, get messages. Ugh, I knew there was a catch. No, I mean, my... My Gmail is absolutely flooded. And so that's that's it, you know. If you want to message me for the, the friend uh, Fridays, do it um, via Patreon. Send me a message. It's the only way I'll consider you. If you want the Narcan, write my normal Gmail. Write Narcan in the subject. I'm going to try to come up with a separate Gmail account for Narcan specifically. But if you want to get involved with friend uh, with Fan Fridays... I'm going to start picking one person a week, uh, do an hour long story, your best story, and I'll do an introduction video for you, uh, you know, like a little five minute introduction. I'm also going to do friend Fridays, like uh, my first, the first guy that I'm going to bring on uh, has an amazing story, selling millions of dollars worth of cocaine and, and marijuana, uh, you know, and he's not somebody whose story's out there um, like some of these other people. He's going to be the first one on Friend Fridays, and uh, I'm looking for my first Fan Friday as well. So there'll be two of those videos on Fridays. I'm going to start doing a series called Tap Tuesdays, where it's, um, you know, my best friend and I have these conversations every night, multiple hour conversations. They're pretty interesting. He's, you know, the uh, polar opposite of me. He's like some mellow yoga, new age guy. He's the one that does the art for the shaky Jake Blotter he did it for the snake ordinance blotter, and he's my best friend, and we talk every night. Conspiracy theories to, uh, you know, drugs, sex, 
uh, what's going on in my day-to-day -day life. It'll almost be like a vlog. It's going to be audio only, kind of like a, a new model for podcasts. Sometimes I'll conference call somebody too, so we'll have, you know, like a guest on. That's going to be on Tuesdays. That's only going to be available on Patreon. Uh, today, Karina, my wife, did a Q&A for Patreon um, for the, uh, you know, $10 tiering up. And I put that up there already. So I put a lot of extra content on there. Like, you know, yesterday I posted a couple phone calls that my best friend recorded while I was in state prison. Those are pretty interesting. Um, I think it gives you a glimpse of my personal life outside of my stories, you know. And um, I think that it, it it's interesting. If you like my content, um, Patreon's a really good way to go, you know. Ten cents a day, you know, to feed this junkie than that. Um, so I do appreciate everybody that has done that and I have a lot of ideas for new content. I also want to do like a live call-in show on Sundays so it'll be like a YouTube live but I'll get a program where you can actually call and like you know be like you are such a drug addict. Mm. Hello? You know, I'm sure she'll call. Well, you know, whatever. All right. So anyway, that's my little six minute and thirty second spiel. Um, let's get into the story. Uh, so I'm in a bad situation. I'm at White Memorial Hospital in the first week of 2017. U.S. Marshals have suspected me of smuggling balloons full of drugs. Balloons. They actually said that. And I'm attempting to get it into this institution, MDCLA. So they say, allegedly, right? So the Samoan and the other guy were, were, were horrible. You know, they were straight up dictators, totalitarian U.S. Marshals. Then this black guy comes in with this like shorter Hispanic guy. And right off the bat, they're cool. You know, they uncuff me. And they leave one of my legs shackled to the bed. And they're just more humane than these other guys. So, of course, my dope fiend mind, even though I'm sick. I'm very sick at this point. They're giving me Tylenol 3s. And they're giving me Librium. And they're giving me um, Clonidine and uh, Nicorette patches, which was cool. They don't do that for you in jail. Uh, but all in all, I'm still feeling it. I'm still getting the shakes. I'm, I'm trembling very bad. And, you know, people are always like, oh my God, you're, you're always rocking. Like, what's up? Are you okay, bro? Uh, that's just how I am. I have a lot of energy. I pace all the time. You know, if pacing is like a pet peeve of yours, you'll, you could never hang out with me because I pace and pace and pace and pace. And I always am, I have to be moving. Um, that's how my brain works as well. And that's why I've always been into heroin because it, it silences those racing thoughts for me, and the racing thoughts make my life um, almost unmanageable at certain points. You know, just I can't uh, finish tasks. It's just it's real ADD, ADHD. I think ADHD, um, and impulsivity is a symptom of that. Um, but you know, now I'm I'm chopping it up with this black guy and uh, the Hispanic guy. These, these new U.S. marshals who are actually treating me well and I'm sick and these guys like me right off the bat you know um, I start telling them how I'm an author and that kind of you know segues into um, me telling them stories now these guys really liked my stories believe it or not um, I started telling them all about my life and everything that was going on I started telling them stories about my ex-wife you know who I was still married to at that moment and you know these guys were cracking up not all law enforcement is bad. You know, there's plenty of cops out there. There's plenty of feds out there even that are doing good stuff. You know, they're out there, you know, finding people that are selling child pornography or getting child molesters or getting rapists or terrorists. Um, you know, I don't, I, I have respect for some law enforcement. Not all. A lot of them are, are really bad. Uh, but these guys just seem like normal guys. Like in another life, we'd probably be drinking beers and, and chopping it up. And they're liking my stories and they're laughing. And I explained to them how this Samoan guy, I'm like, look, this other U.S. Marshal that came in here is absolutely tripping. I'm coming off alcohol, fentanyl, and heroin. 
I go to the bathroom, I'm having explosive diarrhea, and then I throw up, I have vomit in my mouth, he thinks I have balloons in my mouth, I mean, this guy is really out of his mind, you know, and, and, they, and they're like, they think this is hilarious, they're like, yeah, yeah, that dude's a homo, and I'm like, Phew. I don't know, I don't care, I don't know, but he's, he's delusional, I don't have anything on me, and, you know, they're like, well, you know, we, we, you know, we, we gotta get a sample from you. I mean, that's it. We don't have any choice. And I'm like, yeah, for sure. But I already knew that they weren't gonna be like, first of all, normal human beings are gonna stand in that doorway. They're gonna smell that rank, foul stench seeping out of my, permeating out of my butthole. And they're not gonna wanna stand there. What normal human would wanna do that? Well. I mean, my wife is always telling me that she catches me, like, touching my butthole and then smelling it. Um, not sure where I picked up that habit, but it's definitely one of the weirder, more embarrassing things that I do and don't even realize it. She's always like, dude, are you smelling your butthole? And I'm like, I'm like caught doing it. I'm like, no, but I really do do that. Um, so I guess there are some people that like smelling shit. Um... But I don't like smelling other people's shit. It's just myself. And when I'm dope sick, of course, odors are amplified. So I don't like that as well. So regardless of the fact that I think that I'm going to be able to somehow get out of this, that they're not going to be as attentive while I'm shitting, I'm still trying not to go, which is like really difficult when you're kicking because your stomach, you, you get, you know... Um, you get that, that bubbly stomach. And diarrhea is one of the only things that makes that storm that's going on inside of you calm down a bit. You know, you have to get it out. It's almost like painful gas. And like, you're just like, <laughs> and you're like, oh, it's just relief. You need it. But for obvious reasons, I'm holding it. And it was really, really difficult. So I want to say like a a day I have these guys for three days and I know that so I'm like okay if I like because I know because I'm asking like now we're like we're friends you know I'm like having them like look up stuff about me on the internet and I'm like I'm you know I'm like yeah like I'm an author and you know I had told them all this and they were like really impressed by that I mean some people find that kind of stuff impressive I guess uh, or at least more interesting than some of the people that I'm sure that I can only imagine some of the weirdos that they have to watch in the psych ward unit of White Memorial. They're federal inmates. I mean, they'd probably come across some very, very strange people. And I hit it off with them. They thought I was funny. And they told me that the Samoan and his partner were going to come back, you know, after the 72 hour period. It cycles out with shifts. So my whole plan is to leave the hospital early without shitting. But I crack, like day two. And I'm sitting now, remember, I only have one leg shackled to the bed, and I'm behaving myself, because these guys are being cool with me. I mean, we're watching, like, you know, we're watching CNN, and we're just kind of commenting on what we're watching, and I find him like, hey, man, um, I got to go. I got to use the restroom. And he's like, all right, well, uh, you got you to gotta fill up this bag. It was like this, you know, plastic bag this big. I'm like, okay, yeah, for sure. Now, I knew how much liquid shit was going to come out. So I knew that I could fill up that bag, like, you know, with a reasonable amount of mud and fish out the balloons. And there was no way I was going to put it back in my mouth. That's what I wasn't going to do. This time I was going to go the, the cheeking route because the way that I was thinking about it is like, these guys were cool. Even if the balloons pop out of my butt, you know, they're going to look at it and see that it's tobacco. Like, I'm not trying to smuggle heroin or any sort of drug in there. It's just tobacco. I got, like, a good enough rapport with them where I really didn't think they were going to trip. So my whole plan was that, you know, go in, shit, fill it up with some so that there's some specimen that they can show to cover their ass. Get the balloons, do some sort of, um, you know wipe it enough where I'm not like sticking my own shit back up my butt and just keister these balloons so I don't have to taste it again. I sit on the bathroom, uh, on the toilet, and the black dude comes and right off the bat, he's being way, he's paying way less attention to me. 
you know, he's keeps talking to his partner. So he keeps turning. He's turning enough where, you know, I'm just like, it comes out. I start like, you know, I'm doing the same thing. I'm acting like I'm wiping, but I'm like sticking my hand into this just dark, uh, ugh, bowl of my own shit. I feel the balloons and it, you know, at this point, They've come out of my ass twice, so my asshole is just burning, you know? It feels like when you, like, are eating, like, a bunch of jalapenos or, like, hot sauce and then you shit and it just burns. And then even just wiping it, dealt, you know, gently really irritates it. Or, like, you know, it, it it's really, really stinging at this point because balloons have popped out multiple times. That's just not a normal thing to happen out of your butthole, believe it or not. And so he's not really looking grab it, I wipe them, and I just ram it back up my ass. No lube, no nothing, but it's so wet from the diarrhea that it just kind of plops back in there. Now I'm wearing an assless gown, you know? You know how it is if you've been to the hospital. So I'm like, I'm still a little worried that it might come out, and how, you know, how well am I going to be able to squeeze my, my butt cheeks together and just keep it stuck in there? And kind of wipe, and I asked him, you know, as I'm wiping, I'm like, hey man, can I just get a little privacy to wipe? He's like, yeah, go for it. Now, he didn't realize that I was already, that I'd already put something up there, and I filled the rest of this bag up, just like I had planned in my head, with like that much of this muddy shit, and there's like water, you know, it's like, I got it out of the toilet bowl, I just kind of scooped it, which is disgusting, because there was like shit in the little zipper, you know, the Ziploc part of the bag, there's like there's like poop stuck in it, and I just like he's. I'm like, what do I do with this bag? He's like, oh, just leave it there. I'm not gonna touch that. Nurse is gonna come get it. I was like, all right, cool. So now I have the balloons back up my butt, and I go lay back on the bunk. You know, I have to like shuffle back there, and um, they end up putting my ankle back on the bedpost. And I know that these other guys are coming back once again. I do the same stupid shit that I did back in 2009 and I want to leave the hospital early AMA because I'm so petrified once the Samoan gets back that I'm going to be absolutely screwed that they're going to bring me through an x-ray machine and they're going to find these balloons and I'm just going to be screwed. So I tell these guys like, hey, you know, I'm feeling better. I'm not feeling better at all. Hot flashes. I'm sweating profusely. I'm still hallucinating to some degree. Not as bad as I was the first couple of days. That definitely dissipates as the withdrawal, you know, goes on. Um, mostly, I'm I'm feeling the heroin withdrawal the most. Tylenol three, come on, Tylenol threes is gonna do nothing. It's like, it, it's just, um, it, it's not enough. It's not enough to make you feel well. Uh, if anything, it just, it's like a placebo and it doesn't do anything. I don't know why you would ever put a dick in your mouth for something like that. I mean, if you're going to put a dick in your mouth in the very, very, like, extreme circumstance where you have no other option, and honest to God, I haven't been to that rock bottom yet. I'm hoping that I never have to. It's never been offered to me. No one's, I have never heard a drug deal. I, you know, listen, I've showed up more times than I can count to a drug dealer with no money. And I've pulled some sleazy stuff, like, you know, I, I used to have this, this, like, woman um, that was my drug dealer, and uh, she wasn't very good looking, and, um, you know, I'd hit on her or whatever. I remember one, it was like Mother's Day, she had a kid, and I went, I didn't have any money, but I went to the pharmacy, and I stole a Mother's Day card, and I, like, you know, brought it to her, and I was like, I don't have money, but I did get you a Mother's Day card. And she just looked at me, and she's like, dude, you're such a scumbag but that's pretty clever. Here you go. She like got me well. I was like, fuck yeah. Um, but I've shown up so many more times than I can count to drug dealers without money. Not one time. You know, I've been like, look, man, like check it out. Um, I, I'll show him my book, you know, dude, I wrote this book and like, look, it's, um, I, I'm about to get an advance for my new book from this publisher and they're going to give me like 40,000. Dude, give me a gram right now. And I'll give you $100 for it. You can make $100 off a gram that you're normally charging me 50 or 60 bucks for. And, you know, usually they'd be like, dude, right, right. 
you owe me like three hundred dollars, bro. And you know, I'm trying to get credit from them, but not one time have they been like, you know what, man? How about you suck my dick? Not once, never, never. And it, I mean, it's not the kind of thing that I mean. How do you even ask for something like that if you're a heterosexual male? Hey man, I don't have money, but I can suck your dick. And then you get beat up? Any drug dealer I know would beat the fucking shit out of me if I said something like that. I'm just so curious as to how that part of that works. I would love for somebody to come on here and talk about that specifically. Um, and if, you know, as I've said before, if you've had to do that, like, hey, you know, not everybody... Uh, not everyone can think of hustles and scams, you know. Sometimes you gotta resort to, like, that really old-fashioned hype shit from, like, 1980s New York, you know. That's what I picture, like, crackheads in the 80s being like, yeah, dude, let's fucking suck your cock, fucking let me get a blast off, bro. Woo! So I look at the 80s, but uh, anyway, woo, weird tangent. Um, so I asked to leave the, uh, <laughs> I asked to leave the hospital AMA, Doctor's telling me, like, hey, man, like, check it out. You're in the hospital right now. You have a menu. Because, like, I could pick pancakes. I'm not eating a lot. I'm dope sick. I mean, I'm not really eating, so that's not one of the reasons that I want to stay anyway. But you have, like, a, one of those beds that you can control. I mean, back when I was, like, you know, in the bondage situation, I couldn't do anything. It didn't matter. And if I asked the Simone, like, hey, man, um, do you think you can adjust this? He would just stare at me and, you know, just flex his little tribal tattoo and like move thought he was so hard uh he wouldn't do it for me though but now that i you know wasn't cuffed to the bed post my legs aren't cut i can actually adjust the bed however i want it so you get a comfortable bed you have a tv i had a remote uh the u.s marshals i was with at that moment were actually pretty cool um and they take you for a walk once a day and uh, I know it doesn't sound like that cool to, to you guys, but you'd see women, which is like always, if you can get in a situation where you can see women in jail, you always want to go for a situation like that. Even if you're dope sick, just seeing a woman makes you feel better because it's one of the things that like gets so lonely about prison is when you're cut off from women or, you know, women that are trained to ignore you or to be not nice to you. You know, you start getting like a complex, you know. Um, so just like sometimes looking at girls, even if they're, you know, basket case in the psych ward girls is still a major benefit. So there were a lot, you know, the pros uh, were a big enough incentive where I should have stayed. But I was so scared that the Samoan was going to come and like, you know, and bust me for these balloons that I just decided to sign out AMA. So they take me back to MDCLA. Now... I have the balloon stuck up my butthole, and I know from going there in 2009 exactly what the protocol is going to be. I'm going to get back to MDCLA. They're going to put me like uh, on that intake floor that I talked about, where it's like the big like bullpen style with different tanks, and they take your thumbprints and everything in the middle. And then they are going to. I'm going to talk to a lieutenant. He's going to be like, "Hey, um, are you a snitch? Are you a sex offender? Do you have enemies?" And you know. No, no, no. Cool. We can put you anywhere. We can put you on any floor. Um, I think in the feds, what you have separate teas. You know, if you like, if you have an, if you've gotten in a fight with someone, they give you a separate tea. You can never be housed with them ever again. Uh, if you snitched on somebody, um, you know, they put a separate tea on that person so that you know. So they do this intake process to make sure that they're not putting you in some weird, you know, situation, um, which is don't want to get off topic too much but this is what i think why the feds killed whitey bulger they knew damn well putting him in a usp that's uh you know primarily mafia in the population and mafia that is sworn enemies of whitey bulger because he ratted so many people out um it you know they knew that he was going to get killed they wheel him into the unit, and somebody gets a lock and a saw, cracks him in the... It's like in his 80s, cracks him in the skull, and he just drops dead. And the person took credit for it. 
So that's why I think Whitey Bulger was a hit because I, and the only reason I bring it up is to, you know, say because this is what their protocol is and it's to try to keep you safe. They knew damn well what they were doing with Whitey Bulger and that's why he's dead. It was a hit. You know, it was a federal hit. They, they're they responsible for his death and I'm sure they've done that to a lot of people and I firmly believe that that's the truth. Um, once you're in that initial intake area, I remember they had like intercepted me and given me the breathalyzer and the the nurse or whoever was giving me the intake was like, oh my God, the breathalyzer must be broken. You are so wasted. I don't know. She didn't talk like that. I'm not sure why I went there with her voice, but, um, you know, so I go back and now they clear me. I have the balloons and I know that they're going to bring me to this other floor. It's very like scary place. They take you. It's like three stalls and they bring three inmates at a time and they make you get butt naked. Um, and let me see if I can like stand up and do the, like I don't know. Doesn't it, they make you um, they make you like go like this, right? So you, you get butt naked, which is yeah, you get used to this after you've been embarrassed so many times in jail and prison just being naked. And for someone like me who's got like an abnormally small penis, it's like very 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 um, degrading to just be standing there and you've got this little root beer beer old, you know sized penis. And you got these guys that are all looking at it, like stone cold. Like, you know, they don't start laughing. They don't start smiling. But you're thinking in your head, man, second I put my pants on and go somewhere else, they're going to be like, damn, did you see Leone? That guy's cock is fucking tiny. And this is the kind of stuff that you're thinking about as you're stripping down and, and doing this, uh, you know, the strip search. They make you run your hands through your hair. They make you go like this. Ah, you know, go, like show all your teeth, make sure you don't have anything, ears, you have to touch everything, you have to go, you have to put your hands up, and then they make you squat and cough, you know, right in front of them too, I mean, it's like very pornographic, like you, you like spin around, I mean, you can do it with style, you spin around, and you just go down, and you go, <coughs> and like look back, you know, look back at them while you're doing it, <coughs> and that's not designed for balloons to plop out of your asshole. That's not the reason that they make you squat and cough. The reason that they do that is because people stick shanks, they stick razor blades up their asshole, and the whole theory is that when you squat and cough, it makes it move, and if you have something that's uh, metal, you know, some sort of weapon with like a point on it, whether it be like, a, you know, a, any kind of shank, and it moves, it's gonna cut you. And blood will come out of your asshole. They make you squat and cough three times. I mean, they wanna make sure if you have a weapon, it's gonna cut you and blood's gonna come out and give you up. And I've heard plenty of stories where people actually got busted that way. But there's a big misconception. They think that the reason that you're doing that is um, for drugs or for contraband. Nah, look, you're just get two fingers. Your little um, proverbial suitcase is about you know, it's about that big. Think about how many balloons you can fit in that two finger space. That's like how far up you can stick something um, up your butt and, and it'll stay there. Um, yes, you can clench your stomach together. That's a good technique that I've perfected over the years because sometimes I'm bringing, you know, crazy contraband in. That's like, like a landline with like a spiraling cord. No, I mean, but I have brought like big, you know, stuff in there, packs, uh, you know, balloons, whatever, mostly in county jail, but you know, in the feds as well. So I knew that I was going to have to do that. Um, I didn't have lubrication and I wasn't really prepared to keep, I like to have a lube so you can really like, you know, get it up there. Uh, but I didn't have any of that. And the first time I got, I barely got through that process. You know, if you guys remember my first five years in federal prison, I barely got through that. They bring you up. There's these three stalls. They do the stuff that I, you have to show on the bottom of your feet. You have to lift up your nut sack, which is always, um, that's always kind of interesting. And then, you know, the squat and cough, uh, the aforementioned squat and cough. And there's like someone standing there with like an AR-15 and they have dogs right there. I mean, it's, it's scary. Yeah, you really feel like you're in trouble when you're in this, and there's like this, um, there's like this chain link fence that leads out to this parking lot. 
So there's always this draft and there's this very like eerie glow that is illuminated from that parking garage. It just looks so hellacious. It looks like hell on earth. If you can um, picture what I'm saying, it's hard to describe. But um, if I go through the intake process, they take me up there. I go to squat and cough. I'm like, all right. You know, it's not like um, I had too many opportunities where I was alone to really ram that shit up there. But anything was possible. The balloons might fall, whatever. And I get through it. <coughs> Look back at them. and Very good. Get dressed. Cool. So they give you your change of clothes. And uh, I believe in MDCLA, it's like green scrubs. And they give you like these shower shoe looking things. And you have orange socks on. It's a very goofy outfit. Usually in federal custody, you're in khakis. You know, you have like a khaki uniform. Um, if you ever seen the movie Blow, what Johnny Depp wears in that movie when he's, uh, you know, in the feds, that's exactly what you wear to this day. It's like a khaki, um, you know, uh, jumpsuit type thing. Or it's a button up and khaki pants, and then you get this like really lame, like plastic belt thing. And they give you black work boots. So I, I make it past that phase, and they bring me to the housing unit. I think it was like 7 South, maybe 8 South. I'm not sure. Forget which floor I was on. But I go in there, and, um, you know, it's, it's very similar to 2009. They give you some linen, uh, you know, and you're like, you come in there, and you, maybe you're with one or two people, sometimes not. That particular time, I was by myself. So I walk into this unit, I'm holding linen, and I'm very, very, very dope sick. But my fear of getting busted outweighed that. You know, I was like, I had to get out of that hospital because that Simone was out to get me. And I walk in there and everybody looks at me. I'm the new guy. Everybody, and it's like the cliche prison stare. Like, you know, the black dude like playing chess with like the New York you know, like half beanie thing on the cap with like the glasses, the Malcolm X looking dude. And you like, you know, he's like in the middle of like doing a chess move and he just turns at you and he stares at you. And then there's like some Pisces and they're, you know, they're throwing down cards playing spades or, you know, or there's like other black dudes like throwing down dominoes and like everybody seems to just stop what they're doing and mad dog you. Um, it's quite intimidating, especially dope sick. You're just like, oh, I could never even defend myself if I had to in this condition. And it's true. And typically, if you're at a place with solid people of your own race, um, now, you know, I've said it before, but I, I may as well mention I'm not a racist guy whatsoever. I'm married to a Hispanic woman. I have a half Mexican son, um, and I've never disliked anyone because of their sexual orientation, religion, political preference, um, race, whatever. I don't like people just based on them being a shitty person. Problem with prison is that when you're white, you uh, you know are are automatically compartmentalized in that group. If you're black, same thing. If you're Mexican, you're divided by Pisa or South Sider. Difference is Pisa are like, uh, you know, guys that are truly from Mexico or like non-gang member Mexican people, you know. South Siders are Soreños. They're, you know, Mexican gangbangers that are actually from a neighborhood. Now, occasionally you'll run into like an Armenian dude that's like, yo, I'm running homie. And you're like, what the fuck? You're not a... You're not a fucking super serio fucking homie. You're some Armenian rich dude from L.A. Why are you a homie? And you know, then you you find out later that they're like getting extorted by them. And, you know, their little consolation prize is like, hey, fool, um, if anyone asks, fool, tell them that you're running homie too, fool. And then the Armenian's eyes just like, are like, oh, my God, I'm a homie. And then, like, you know, they want to tell you like, hey, fool, uh, I'm homie. It just doesn't sound right. You're like, you are not a homie. Uh, and, you know, I was resident in Southsider in 2009, basically, because they just wanted all my commissary. And I found that out later. Um, but, uh, you yeah, know, we talked about that. Chenny. Um, and typically, if you're at a solid place, the, like, say you're white, the right thing that should happen in a situation like that is, like, the guy, the rep for the whites, the shot caller comes up to you and go, you know, Hey, what's up, man? I'm Pirate Dan from Long Beach. 
you know, it's always like some like super like, you know, deep voice and, you know, um, kind of guys that, that drive lifted trucks and listen to like anthrax and, you know, oh, yeah, fuck, fucking hate minorities, bro. Yeah, brother, fuck them. Huh. Ooh, check out this new hip hop joint I got. Ooh, check this out. Oh, it's fucking ill, huh, fool? You're so confused. I've always thought dudes like that are just like, whoa, man, you're you're out, you're way out. But nobody came up to me in this particular place. So right off the bat, I knew that I was in some fuck. I'm like, oh my god, I'm not solid white people here. I'm dope sick. I have these balloons. I have to find drugs. I have to call my ex-wife to. You, I. Th where have you been? Where have you been? You were gone for five. Hours. That's a real video. You guys can watch that. Um, Ryan Leone, Toxic Relationship. Put that into your YouTube search and you'll find her real voice. And you can tell me how accurate I am with my, um, when I'm doing the imitation. But, uh, so, right off the bat, I know that there's not solid white guys there. You know, I'm looking and I'm seeing, like, a couple, like, spooky ones kind of scutter along. And you're like, wow, that... And, and typically, it's like, you're either a rat or a child molester. If you're not going to come up to the new white guy and be like, oh, I'm Pirate, I'm Pirate Billy from North Hollywood. Oh. If you're not going to do that, and you've probably, you know, um, you're probably there for kitty porn or something. And that's very common in the feds. And it's like, nowadays, they're doctoring paperwork. So, like, they'll give, like, some hardcore child molester. Like, you know that this dude's a child. It looks like the the, the subway guy, uh, what was his name? I don't even, I can't think of it. You know, someone will, you know, a million people comment and say this guy's name. I can't think of it. But you know, the guy that was like the, the, the icon for subway and then he got caught kitty porn. And he looks like, a, and then everyone's like, oh my God, we should have seen it coming. Look at that fool. He looks like a straight chomo. Um, and usually if they look like a chomo, I mean, not to, not to be too stereotypical and judge a book by a cover, but typically if you look like a child molester in prison, you, you are, you know, from my experience. And they just, there's no protective custody in, in federal prison, they, especially not in the beginning phase. There's a couple yards spread out, like Coleman in Florida, USP Tucson, there's some other spots in Arizona that are, be, that are like, mm, they're questionable yards because they put just like the worst of the worst there, the worst sex offenders and, um, you know, but it's not like state prison where like there's all these different pop. There's like SNY, GP. It's not like that in the feds, not yet. But I I imagine that it will get like that. So they assign me a cell. No white guy talks to me. Like I said, there's a couple chomo looking guys kind of scuttering along, and I'm I'm feeling like shit anyway. And uh, I go up to the cop. I'm like, hey, um, where uh, what cell am I assigned to? And he's like, you're in. Uh, you know, D13 or whatever. I'm like, all right, cool. I go in there and uh, it's a paisa, right? And, um, you know, last time when I was there, it's like you could sell up with South Siders if you're white. Um, you definitely can't sell up with black people uh, and you definitely can't sell up with paisas or you couldn't back then or, you know. Um, so I see the paisa and he's just kind of, he's like this little, this paisa, these little glasses and he kind of looks at me like reading a book and I'm like hey is this D whatever yes I'm like oh, oh hell no I like just take my linen and just walk right back to the cop and I'm like okay <laughs> good one buddy where am I really housed he's like no that's where you are I'm like I'm like all right so I go and I just kind of like put my linen by the door I kind of just sit there and the south sider comes to me he's like yeah Hey, what's up, fool? Uh, I'm Baby Scrappy from uh, Monte Flora, or whatever. I don't want to, I shouldn't have said a neighborhood like that. And I mean, no disrespect to the homies. I've had a couple South Sider friends be like, hey, fool. Hey, dog. The shit you say, fool? Nah, dog. It's fucking disrespectful, fool. Palabra, dog. And I don't mean to be disrespectful, but you know what I'm saying. Some South Sider comes up and he talks to me and, and he's like, what's up? And I'm like, I'm not selling up with the paisa. There's no way I'm going to do that. And he's like, he's like, nah, dog, like, that's, that's just how it is, fool. You know what I mean, dog? You know what I mean? You know what I mean? And they always say that over and over again. Have you ever noticed that? Like, dudes that have been schooled in prison in California always say, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You know what I mean? 
It gets so annoying. Like, sometimes it's punctuated with every word. Like, I'm going to commissary, you know what I mean? On Wednesday, you know what I mean? If my chick sends me money, you know what I mean? They're like, fuck, dude. So, like, if you, if you have a celly like that, I've had them. It drives you batshit crazy. Um, so I'm talking to the sell side. He's telling me that I can basically sell up with this paisa. And I'm like, dude, I don't know. Is that, like, who's the white rep? And he's like, <laughs> He's like, it ain't like that, fool. I'm like, what do you mean it's not like that? Did, uh, did, was there some, like, you know, anti-prison politic parade that I wasn't invited to that happened since the last fucking time? I'm only in prison. Of, you know, this is in 2007. I've only been in, I was in prison four years ago. You definitely couldn't sell up with the Paisa then. What the, what's going on? Um, you know, and it, what's funny is back then they did sell me up with a Paisa, but the only reason that it was acceptable was because he was my co-defendant. Like, in, like, at that particular time, there weren't even, it was the same thing. There weren't, like, any solid white people either. But it's the kind of thing where you don't just want to, you know that you're not, sp like, if you make it to a main prison, you definitely can't sell up with a pipe. Like, that does not happen. Like, if you go to Victorville or you're going to Lompoc, that doesn't even happen. Like, you have to sell up with your own race. That's it. Uh, so it's like, it's a weird gray area because MDCLA is not prison, but it is. It's kind of run the same way. Um, and I didn't know what to do. But back in 2009, my first cell, it was a PISA, but because he was my co-defendant, it was like, okay. So they have these, I don't know, very confusing rules. I didn't know what to do. Um, and the South Siders tell me it's okay. So I'm like, oh, you know, God, like, he's just so buggy, you know? And he's like, yeah, dog, I know, fool. It's fucking weird right here, dog. They they fucking eat with black fools. I'm like, who eats with black fools? He's like, the white boys, fool. We're fucking black fools. Now, like I said, I mean, I'm not racist, but when I get to prison, I'm down for my race because I have to be. There, it's. I mean, it, it is what it is. Um, eating with black people in prison is like a huge no-no if you're white. And I'm and like, this Southsider's like, you know, and he's a young, he's like 22, 23. He's like, yeah, fool. They fucking, we fucking eat with them and shit, fool. They're not even like us. They're, they're black, fool. But we eat with them. I'm like, what, you eat with them too? He's like, yeah, serio, fool. And so now I'm just completely like, I don't know what's going on. I, I don't know what politics is what who I'm allowed to sell up with because they let me go in, back in 2009 because of this, but now there's this, and now it's like the way he's saying it, there is no order anymore. It's like a free-for-all. I'm like, what else can I, can I just run up debts? Is that what I'm allowed to do too? Hey, who's got drugs? Let me get all everything on credit. It seems like there's no rules anymore, which is good because I never really liked the racist shit anyway. I was so much happier in Wisconsin. You know, I didn't have to be involved. You know, with like the weird riots that would crack up. Hey, fool. Uh, hey, hey, the black fool. He didn't say excuse me when he farted, fool. We're going to fucking go at it with those fools. We're going to fucking kill like 30 black people because he didn't say excuse me. Fuck them. And that's really how it is. As silly as that sounds, the riots that are going down in California state prison and in federal prison in California, if you're on like one of the rougher yards, it's going, it's stuff's cracking off over respect, over words, over nothing meaningless shit you know that it, it, it it's it's absolutely just for posturing purposes you know it's just to to like show you know who's who's what and and where the races stand and uh it, it's it's not a good situation to be in anyway i end up selling up with this just hey the, you know this little like dorky paisa guy and i'm like whatever and uh I knew he was, I knew he was a bitch, right, when I got in the cell, I'm, you know, he's like, he's like laying in the bottom bunk, he's like, hey, um, would you like the bottom bunk? I'm like, yeah, you know, you always have to like assert your dominance, now, I'm probably sounding like such a piece of shit, like brainwashed prison person, I'm not, I play the part when I have to in there. And then you get confused when you're in a situation like this because the rules don't even apply that you learned four years back. You know, back then, if you sat at a table with a black guy and ate with him, you're going to get stabbed, like, straight up. Now it was, like, all mixed and, like, whatever. So, you know, I'm, I'm sick. I'm laying in the bottom bunk. Of 
course I can't sleep. I'm regretting the fact that I left the hospital early. I take the balloons out and I kind of am washing them in the, um, you know, in the sink. And I just go back into the bunk and I just kind of am laying there. And some white guy comes in there. He's like very heavy set, little like soul. All he has is a soul patch, which is never a good sign, you know. And he's like, uh, hey, man, um, you know, I'm I'm uh, so and so from Orange County. How are you? Doesn't knock, nothing, like no prison etiquette. I'm sitting there dope sick. I'm like, hey, what's up? The, the Paisa, just, you know, he's got like the Urkel expression on, just like, hmm, just not a care in the world. It's like, hey, man, um, we are in prison. He just, he, you know, it, you run into people like that where I don't even know if they're aware of what's going on or where they are. They're always happy. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of mentally ill people in prison that, that don't understand exactly what's going on at that moment. So this white guy starts talking to me. He's like, it's like, um, yeah, so, you know, I'm sure you've probably noticed it's, it's pretty chilly right here. It's chill. There's nothing going down. Everybody gets along and, uh, we kind of have a rep. Um, it's Big Ed. He's upstairs, but like, he doesn't leave the cell. You know what I mean? No, I don't know. What, no, I don't know what you mean. Uh, a, um, you don't have any drugs up your butt, do you? I'm like, I have tobacco. Serious? We've had such a dry spell. Like, it's been hella chilly, but no drugs, no tobacco, you know? Uh, we've been just snorting while butrin and, and and just getting along, you know. Um, can I get some of that tobacco? And I'm like, you know, now I'm looking at the paisa. I'm like, fuck, should I do business in front of this fucking weirdo? He's like, just looking at me and I just kind of like turn my back. I'm sick. I'm like, so let me ask you, there's no heroin here? He's like, <laughs> not since I've been here, man. Nah. It's just been nothing but chilly. I'm like, why did I leave the hospital? And, uh, you know, I'm like, look, man, I open up the balloon. And, I mean, that tobacco, I've been through some shit. Now, to find out that the only, th like, I have no drugs coming. The only thing I I'm, can do is, is sell what I can to help with the rent. So I bless this white dude. I'm like, here, dude, um, whatever his name was. He's like, thanks, brother. And he like takes off and I go, listen, don't tell anyone I have tobacco, especially if it's a dry spell here. I do not want to be the only guy that's coming in right. I already know how that's going to be. He's like, dude, of course, bro. Thanks again. And he like takes off. I'm like, fucking lame get back in my bed I'm like oh my god of course I immediately start beating off because it's the only relief that I can get I just and I'm not even like doing my normal techniques where I'm like pitching a tent with my you know with my knee and like doing it with the re you know typically you want to do it with the reverse grip you know like you go like this and jerk off like that because if you think about it you're not going to be like hitting the tent that you've erected with the blanket if it's backwards like that. Like if you're jerking off um, the other way like that, you're not going like this and like hitting the blanket. It's like you can do a much more controlled, just the, the basic uh, masturbatory survival, you know, moves that you have to make to get off and you come in like five seconds and that's why you can do it so i'm just like sitting there doing the reverse stroke not even putting a tent up i'm just like straight like the lights on in the cell i'm just like Ugh. as soon as i come i'm like oh, i'm like back into withdrawal now you know it i get up because i'm starting to think like you know usually they give you a uh, pack number is what they give you in the feds. So you have to like set up this super annoying thing on the phone where um, you have to say your name and you go, Ryan Leone. 
And then every time you use the phone, you have to say it. And it's like some FBI, FBI voice recognition software. So you pick up the phone. You have to type in your PAC number. Everyone has an assigned one. And then you go, Ryan Leone. We're sorry. We did not recognize your name. Please try again. Ryan Leone. We're sorry. We do not recognize. You know, fuck. Especially because, like, typically when I come in, I'm on drugs, so like the tone's different, and then it's it just takes forever. And if there's ba out, if there's um, background noise, it makes it very hard to get it exactly like you said it the first time, and it's just very annoying. A lot of people deal with this. Also, with that pack number and with your register number, you can get on the computer, and with that computer, you can use an email system called CoreLinks. You can download MP3s if you have an MP3 player. Um, you need a pack number assigned to you from your case manager. And typically they don't give it to you for like 24 hours when you hit the, um, you know, when you hit a unit. So, you know, but like sometimes you can use somebody else's number and like you can, you can, you know, jump on the phone if you get caught. It's, it's kind of like a serious thing in federal prison. Like they'll take your commissary for 90 days, take good time over it. Uh, sometimes you go to the hole for it. So I like, despite how sick I was after I jerked off really quick I like you know just wiped it off with my blanket and I got up to go try to see if I can use the phone to call my ex the psycho bitch you know I mean god I've gone I've come this far everything I've been through for these stupid balloons I may as well try to maintain the relationship because that's what like my goal my original intent of this whole thing was and you know I'm like I'm like hey I'm, I'm going to use the phone and he just looks, he didn't even say anything. I'm like, man, fuck, God, this such weirdos, man. I'm stuck in this 8x10 with fucking this bug guy. Such a bug. And uh, so I leave, and I'm, I'm like, kind of like mingling in the day. I'm just going up to people. I'm like, hey, man, can I use your, um, can I, do you think I can make a phone call with your phone? I don't have my pack number yet. And like, people are so spooked, like, no, no way. <laughs> no way. And I'm like, like, you know, in most, like, rougher prisons, like, people don't even, you know, bat an eyelash at shit like that. It's just, like, it's, like, convict etiquette. Like, hey, I need to call my wife. And, like, so, you know, like, a solid person will help you out. Nobody was willing to help me. But then people started coming up to me and being like, hey, man, um, hey, you got any tobacco? N why do you think I have tobacco? Oh, oh, I, I don't know, man. You just came in and like, maybe, like, I don't know. Maybe you brought some in or something. I'm just like, a piece of shit. Couldn't keep his mouth shut. You know, I kick, I blessed him with tobacco. He's going and telling people. I kid you not. I wa I'm like all dope sick. I've given up on using the phone. I'm just like, whatever. I'll use the pack number, you know, the, the next day. I'll get one assigned from the case manager. I walk back to my cell and, uh, there's a line, a multiracial line. It looks like the fucking village people lined up outside of my cell. They all know I have tobacco because this fucking, I forget what his name is, this idiot told them that I brought some in with me. There's a line of people. And they all have, like, commissary. I look, it's like, we may as well just yell that I... Hey, I smuggle contraband in. If you guys want to buy any, bring commissary to my cell. It's all good. It's not going to get me five fucking years. It's like, Jesus Christ, dude. I was so mad at this guy. And uh, I'm like, you know what? Cat's out of the bag. I may as well just get rid of this tobacco. So I'm like, listen, yes, I have some. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, give me a minute. I'm going to go package it. And of course, everybody's like, hey, let me get it all. I can have my, you know, my people just put it on your books. They can do a send out. They can do it right away. Come on. Like everybody there just seems like, like doesn't seem like there's a lot of solid convicts there. Um, and I end up making up, I, I broke up, out one of my balloons and I think, I don't know, I made a deal with somebody to get like $400. Like their people are going to go meet my wife and give her money. And then I got stacked up with a bunch of commissaries. So like one of those balloons got me about a thousand dollars, some in store, some in send out. And then I just was like, listen, I'm not doing anything more tonight. Um, and they locked the door, I think at like 815 at MDCLA. And, um, you know, the next morning I wake up and first, or I never went to sleep, but you know what I mean? Like you get little cat naps when you're kicking like that. 
And when morning had finally, when it was morning time and they're finally like at five in the morning, when you see them do their first walk of the morning and then they come and lock, unlock the doors, I was like standing at the door just waiting for that to happen. And uh, of course, like the few people that are already up doing whatever they're doing are already asking me for tobacco. All I want is to get on that phone and call my ex-wife. That's all I want to do. And I like go upstairs because it's double tiered. You know, it looks like a prison. You know, there's two tiers and each tier has like rows of cells and there's a day room below. Um, and there's tables where people play cards or you, we, that's where we get served chow as well. They bring chow to you. They also bring commissary to you. So everything really happens in the central day room. Um, and then upstairs, there's a case manager's office. And what you want to do, if you really want to talk to case managers, you want to wake up and go, first thing, go to the case manager's office. Um, so that was my plan. I mean, I waited for them to unlock. I was up all night, just miserable. Jer I probably jerked off 19 times. Dude's just up there. Like, every, if I had to, like, shit, which I had to do several times, I would be shitting and, like, you know, I'm courtesy flushing the whole time. And I would just look up and dude would be like, like, three in the morning. I'm like, dude, this dude is so crazy. And he hardly understood English. So it's like, I couldn't be like, I couldn't really explain to him um, my frustrations and why I was uncomfortable with him staring at me taking a shit at, like, three in the morning. It's like, dude, he doesn't even sleep. You just. It's like, how many other guys have you done this to? Seems like, seems like it's, uh, he's a repeat offender, if you know what I mean. So, that morning I go up to the case manager's office and I'm just sitting, you know, I'm like sitting right in front of it, waiting for the case manager together. Usually I get there around 6, they open the doors like 5.15, 5.30, sitting there and like, you know, one of the orderlies, which is like, um, the hell is it called in state? It's, it's you get all these different terms mixed up when you do state time and when you do in state is called a porter in the feds is called an orderly or I guess a trustee would be in like county jail trustee orderly porter it's all the same shit and this orderly comes up to me he's like hey man um are you uh are you waiting for the case manager I'm like no man I'm just I'm just sitting in front of this office for no reason at at 5:45 in the morning you know, I'm all like, and I really, I mean, you know, I joke a lot when I tell these stories, but I really do have an attitude because I'm just so frustrated with the whole situation. I do not like my celly. Um, I don't like the fact, that, like, the one white guy I met told the whole fucking village that I brought stuff in, you know? Uh, and people are just like, it seemed like it was like the most unsolid group of people, like, I've ever seen. I'm like, you know, walking, uh, when I'm walking up to the case manager, you just hear some, like, black guy be like, hey, man, uh, can I buy some of that tobacco? And I'm like, oh my God, dude. Like every, like people are just unslick about it. So anyway, this orderly tells me that, well, um, yeah, the case manager is not going to be here until like Thursday or whatever. It's like a Tuesday. It's like two days out of wait. I'm like, what? How am I going to get my pack numbers? Like, oh, you're hit. I'm like, oh, and I'm petrified that in this time that my wife's left me, you know, she's went to meet one of her Craigslist Johns or whatever. And, um, Finally, the South Sider, old school dude, comes up to me, and uh, you know he he's like, "Hey, um, hey, let me get at you, fool." I'm like, "What's up?" He's like, "Hey, fool, um, I heard you had tobacco or some shit like that, fool." Y you know what I'm talking about, though. You know what I mean, pedal? And I'm like, "Yeah, um, I do have tobacco." And he's like, "Hey, hey, fool, I got tuna, I got mackerel, I got." Uh, Rice, uh, I got chicharrones, fool. Palabra, dog. I'm like, look, I don't want any of that shit. I already have them stacked up with commissary. I already, I already got my wife 400 bucks. Listen, I really need to call my chick. Do you think that you can make that happen for me? And he's like, yeah, fool. He's like, how much will you give me for that? I'm like, look, I'll give you like five or ten dollars worth right now. And he's like, yeah, fucking mando, eh? Which means like, shoot it, bro. On the way. So, we will get into what's going to happen. A um, bunch of things are about to happen, but, you know, obviously I had to kind of set up where everything's going to go. Uh, this guy's about to give me a phone call, going to let me call my ex-wife, and uh, things are about to get very, very interesting. So, thank you guys for checking my content out. Please, please press like. 
you haven't already, comment, even if you have something shitty to say. I don't even care anymore. It's so whatever. Um, and if you can make one of your friends subscribe to me simply by taking their phone and being like, hey, let me see your phone, and then just, you know, go to YouTube and hit subscribe. That would be greatly appreciated. Check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ryan Leone. And uh, much love to all of you. Free Narcan. We'll get all that stuff set up. Palabra.